safely grow your language using types. And if you think about it, language extensions are really everywhere. We have built-in extensions in a lot of compilers, and we have a lot of tools for building customary extensions on top of existing languages. Uh, I want to present an idealized compilation pipeline for such language extensions. So we start in the extended language with the parser. And this can be an extended syntax, doesn't have to be, but typically it produces a syntax tree for you, and then you apply a desugaring to this syntax tree. The desugaring will translate from the extended language into the base language, so we're crossing a boundary here. We are interested in statically typed languages, so the next thing we do is we type check the desugared code. And this either yields you know, no type error and we can compile and run our code and we are happy, or we get a type error back. Let's look at a simple example. So let's say we want to extend Java with four comprehensions as they occur in Scala. So here we have a for loop where x ranges over names and y ranges over nums, and then we put a print statement for each instance of the cross product. We can easily desugar this into Java by generating some iterators, some while loops. The details are not really important here. After the sugaring, we compile this code, and as, said, as I said before, either this type checks and we're happy, or it doesn't type check. But such a pipeline has significant disadvantages. The first one being that uh, we have an abstraction leak. If you get a type error in the desugared code, this type error will mention concepts that the user didn't see, such as iterators or while loops. The second problem is that the desugaring happens after type checking which means that, um, oh no, sorry, another problem first. The second problem is that the origin of a type error is not quite clear. Either the user code is wrong, so the user conta code contains something that makes the type error occur, or the desugaring is wrong and translates the user code in a way that breaks some invariant. The third problem is that in the desugared code, there are some types that did not occur in the user program, such as an iterator over string or a string variable and so on. So the problem is that because desugaring occurs before type checking, we don't have any type information available yet. All right, so what we propose in this paper is to take this classical pipeline and to basically swap the position of type checking and desugaring. In this way, we are pushing the boundary of where you leave the extended language and where you go into the base language until after type errors have been reported. All right, so let's re-inspect what that means for our small example here. Well, the first advantage is pretty obvious. Because type checking occurs before the sugaring, we can directly make use of any information that the type checker inferred for us. So we can write type-dependent desugarings. The second advantage is that any type error that the type checker finds, uh, the, the, we always can blame the user code because nothing else is involved yet. And the third advantage is that we don't have an abstraction leak anymore because a type error will never refer to concepts in the desugared code because, well, the desugared code never was given to the type checker to begin with. All right, so these are the trade-offs that we have. But the big question, of course, is, well, we can't just use any desugaring here, right? We do first the type check, then we apply some transformation to the code, and then, well, I use green color here, but that's probably not really convincing. So the question is, do we actually preserve the well typeness through the desugaring? And what we present in this paper is a framework for extensible languages where we do exactly this, where we have an extensible type checker, and the type checker can use any information that uh, the desugaring can use any information that the type checker produced. And we have an automated verification procedure for guaranteeing that an extension that is admitted in our system always preserves the well typeness of the check code. And the core idea, and this is also what the rest of my talk will be about, is that we desugar no longer syntax terms, but we actually desugar typing derivations. So let's see how SoundX works. Here's a very small, simple example extension that I'm going to use as a running example throughout the rest of the talk. 
So we use PCF as a base language and we extend it with LED bindings where we can have multiple bindings in the single LED construct. So we have some syntax definition here for the keyword LED followed by some bindings, keyword in, and then some body, some term. Uh, and we also define this meta variable BS to refer to sequences of bindings. And this is just a simple example. This is a LED expression where we bind A equals one in A, and then we add it to some other LED expression. So this is the first part of an extension definition in SoundX. The second part is the type rules. So whenever you extend syntax, you need to provide the type rule. And the type rule is like the contract on how the user is allowed to use that syntax. So for LED bindings, we have the typical type rules. There is nothing surprising here, really. Uh, so we require that the bound expression T1 has, as well type has type T1. Then given we have a binding for X of type T1, we need to check that, type, uh, that term T2 has type T2. And that gives us that the LED expression where X is bound to T1 and T2 has type T2. You probably noticed that there are some brackets in the conclusion. What this means is that this is exactly the term that we are going to desugar. So I said that desugarings operate on typing derivations, and they are activated by typing rule instances in the derivation. So whenever we see an instance of typing rule let one, in the derivation, we are going to trigger desugaring. Namely, we are going to rewrite the bracketed part of the conclusion into an application of a lambda abstraction. The desugaring itself is totally standard. It's only the way that we integrate it into the type rule that's new here. And this is really important because what we did here is we actually copied the type of a premise into the desugared conclusion. So the type annotation T1 did not appear in the original user code. It's only from the typing derivation that we were able to extract this information. We have a second type rule for LED, and this is just for the recursive bindings. So we peel off the first binding, and then we have a residual LED expression. And this gets desugared in similar fashion where within the lambda abstraction, we have this residual LED expression in the body. So this just to illustrate how we support recursive desugaring. All right, so I'm going to illustrate how our reform pipeline deals with uh, such a language extension. And let's use this, this term as an example, let A equal one in A. The first thing we do is we type check it and we build up a derivation for it. So, well, this is a LED expression. It, you can type check it, use it, type rule that one. Uh, we get, we have to check the bound expression. It's a literal, use type rule net. We have to check that the uh, body of the uh, binding is well typed. Uh, we can do, use the uh, bar axiom. And this way we get a, a, a total, a complete derivation, typing derivation for this expression. The next step is the desugaring. Okay, so we find an instance of the type rule let one in the derivation, and this triggers the desugaring, and we're going to rewrite the expression, the bracketed part of the type rule, uh, by the template that's given in the type rule as well. And again, just to emphasize it once more, here we copied the type annotation net from the subderivation of this uh, der derivation of let. All right, but we have a problem now, right? Because, well, this is not a valid derivation anymore. You still see that this was supposed to be an instance of type rule let one, but it's not anymore because the conclusion talks about applications and not about lets at all. So that doesn't make sense. So at this point, we have to revalidate our uh, typing derivation. So we did type checking, did desugaring, and now we need to reconstruct it, transform it into a valid derivation again. And we do this uh, using a trick that we presented three years ago at ICFP, where uh, basically we use the existing axioms that we already had. Here it's now subderivations, not axioms, uh, to in order and use the type rules of the base language to reconstruct a valid derivation. So let's just go by example. So we have an application, so we are going to use the app rule of the base language, and this is going to give us two more proof goals. And we see that the first one of those actually precisely corresponds to what we already have. So we already have a valid subderivation for that part of the proof, and we can just reuse it and plug it in. For the second part, we have an abstraction, so we're going to use the apps rule. And again, we already have a proof of that subderivation available. And what I've illustrated here is really the first challenge of 
what happens when you desugar typing derivations. You have to reestablish the validity of desugar derivations. And SoundX, the verification procedure that is within, inside SoundX guarantees that for any extension that we admit, this is always going to succeed. All right, let us look at a slightly larger example. This is really the same lead expression that we just saw before, only now I added two to the result of this lead expression. Okay, so again, we do type checking, we establish a typing derivation, there's nothing surprising here at all. What I want to point out is that we have an additional issue, namely, this lead expression occurs multiple times in the derivation. So let's see what happens when we apply the desugaring. This is exactly the desugaring we just did. We're going to rewrite this subderivation into a desugared derivation that we're going to revalidate, and this is what we plugged back in, okay? But we have a similar problem as before. We have this instance of the type rule add now that's actually no longer a valid instance because uh, if you uh, think about the type rule, it has the same template variable, or meta variable T1 in the premise and the conclusion, which is not the case in our instantiation. So this is no longer an instance of add. So here we are using a technique that we call forwarding. Forwarding is about forwarding the desugared forms from uh, towards the root of the derivation. And basically we are just going to try to find a reinstantiation of the type rule we already had, uh, where we can rebind the meta variables to the desugared forms that we get from the subderivations. So basically, we're looking for a substitution that uh, replaces, that, that gives a binding to the meta variables of type rule add and matches the subderivations that we have. And we're going to use this to produce a new conclusion. And we show that this always succeeds, except for very rare cases. And the details, they're intricate, and the paper will have a little more to say about this, but let me just summarize the challenge. The second challenge is, that you have to propagate the sugared forms throughout the uh, derivation because the, uh, the sugared forms occur multiple times and you somehow need to synchronize or coordinate this desugaring. <coughs> and what we do is we forward the desugared forms from the leaves towards the root of the tree. As I mentioned there, it can fail and when it fails, uh, it's because the sugared form occurs multiple times in different subderivations, but they, they share the same meta variable in one of the type rules. Uh, and we looked into this and we haven't been able to construct any useful example, any meaningful example. Uh, actually, we only were able to construct an example of this problem where we have an unsound base language. Yes, finally I should say that if forwarding fails, then the desugaring gets stuck but we will never produce ill-type code. All right, so let me do a third and final example here. Uh, this example, we have two bindings. So we have one lead expression with two bindings for B and A. And we can use the second type rule that I, that I showed you at the beginning, and we're going to get, uh, get a residual lead expression that we can check using type rule lead one. And the question now is, we have two possible places where we can do desugaring. We can first desugar let one, or we can first desugar let two. So let's try out what happens when we first desugar let one. All right, we're going to replace it by the desugared form, revalidation, la di la. And then we are trying to do the forwarding again. But so that means we need to find a reinstantiation of type rule let two, such that this subderivation uh, can match the premise of the rule. But if you look at the premise, uh, that won't work, right? We require a let expression in the premise, but actually we have an application, so they just don't match. So it turns out this strategy of first going down towards the leaf and then towards the root is not a successful strategy here. So let's go back. So no desugaring took place yet. Let's try the other way around. So we first desugar let two. And we can easily do this. We uh, get this residual let expression in the, uh, in the lambda abstraction. We do our revalidation. And only then we move up to the next uh, possible place where you can apply desugaring. It's up here. We do the desugaring. 
And now it turns out that the forwarding succeeds. So what this is supposed to illustrate is the third challenge that we encountered, which is the order of desugaring matters. And what we decided to do in SoundX is a single pass down up traversal over the derivation. So we start at the root and we do some of the extensions, some of the desugarings on the way to the leaves and some of the extensions on the way to the root. And our verification procedure, so you have different soundness criteria for each of those extensions. And our verification procedure not only shows that it's sound to uh, do the desugaring, it also classifies the extensions into one of the two categories. And I just want to give you an intuition about why this occurs. And the reason is, uh, so we saw an example of a recursive desugaring where uh, the premise talks about sugared forms. And if you have this, then you cannot go bottom up. You can't stay, start at the leaves and go towards the root of the derivation because this breaks the assumption that's encoded in this type rule. Uh, an example of the other way around where you need to start at the leaves and go towards the root is when you have an illumination form in the premise. Uh, and you can find details in the paper about that or talk to me later. So in the paper, we have uh, formally, very, uh, formally defined all of these things. It's a base language independent formulation where we define what a valid derivation means, uh, what derivation desugaring means, and we precisely describe this verification, uh, this extension verification procedure. And we have two soundless results. The first is that desugaring preserves the validity of typing derivations. And the second is that desugaring does not get stuck except if this weird forwarding uh, error happens. We also implemented the system, uh, and it's a language independent implementation, and we uh, instantiated our implementation by defining uh, a significant subset of Java, which we uh, phrased, uh, coined Java Lite. It supports methods, packages, constructors, fields, generic classes, imports, inheritance, assignments, conditionals, and loops. So quite a, uh, quite a bit. It's about 150 uh, type rules that we need to define. And we've, we have built two extensions in this uh, language. Uh, the first one being we added for each loops. And this is a little bit similar to the example I showed you at the beginning. So this desugars into an iterator and a while loop and so on. But what I want to point out here is this curly praise at the beginning of the generated code. And this is really important. If you didn't generate this curly praise, the extension verification would reject this extension because of scoping. So the type preservation also means you need to preserve the scopes of the code. On top of this extension, we built a second extension, namely these four comprehensions. So this is not the full definition, this is just an example instance. So this would desugar into a nested for loop with some if then else. And this just to show that basically all the features that we built in, we also needed for even this simple example already. So uh, it's a recursive desugaring where we need to find the type from the derivation because it doesn't occur in the user code. And we also use extension composition because this extension desugars into Java base, Java Lite extended with for each loops, which desugars to Java Lite. All right, to summarize, um, I presented you a framework for extensible languages that allows you to safely grow, grow your language. And the, there's a couple of core ideas, the first one being that we type check before the desugaring, not the other way around. And then we perform desugarings on top of typing derivations where we apply these three, uh, solve these three challenges being with revalidation, forwarding, and using a down-up traversal. And we have implemented this and applied it to Java Lite to build two of the extensions that I showed you. Thank you very much. So my question is, are uh, these type systems of the source language and the third language syntax directed? So the reason I ask this is because if the type system is syntax directed, then the 
uh, syntax tree is isomorphic to the typing derivation tree, so it is it's, it's straightforward to translate to rewrite a turn to turn translator into a derivation to derivation translator. So I don't see where the challenges came from. So if, uh, First question, if the, uh, the, the only question no, no, is, no, no. are the type systems syntax directed? Yes, I know. So no, it's not. Um, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. In our implementation, we use you know simple proof search that does backtracking. Thank and you. Your, your second question was. Uh, no, there's well, no no, no, you, no there, second question. Okay. Good enough. Thanks. Very nice work. Um, uh, maybe a similar kind of question about uh, what kind of type systems can you apply this to? Do they have to be compositional? In the sense that, um, you, know, you're, you know, when you're type, type checking a subterm, the only thing you use about that is what the type came out to be and not sort of looking inside there to, you know, to maybe change the, the type. So we applied this to PCF and to Java Lite. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about the compositionality, but it seems plausible that we need compositional type checking for this to work. For the verification procedure needs this to work, I believe. So our implementation, our sound X fixes an order in which the sugarings happen. So it's, a, it's fixed, it's a single pass down up traversal over the derivation. And we're going to apply the sugarings exactly during this traversal whenever we encounter a type rule instance that comes from an extension. Uh, so this is fixed. Um, but the verification procedure categorizes extensions uh, into whether to do them on the way to the leaves or whether to do them on the way to the root. And that can always be done. There is extensions that we will reject. Uh -huh. But if we accept the extension, then it, 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 it works, yes. Thank you. Uh, Julia Belakova, Southern Federal University. Uh, when you sorry. Julia, can you speak up a little okay. bit? Uh, when you talk about desugaring, do you mean really just syntactic desugaring, or can it be some syntactic semantics uh, in there? Because uh, if we just uh, unroll four expressions and uh, this uh, kind of uh, syntactic desugaring, and uh, we have quite uh, rich type system, uh, target type system, then it's it's really cool. But uh, can we do something more? Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand what you mean by semantic desugaring. Yeah, we just uh, unroll this uh, for expression into the target language. Uh, we move these typing rules like up, but we haven't any additional semantics here. Can I add something new? Uh, if I haven't, for example, if I haven't generics in my basic language, I think we cannot add generics uh, and desugar them into something. Oh, okay. So the, it's really desugarings in the sense that the base language needs to be more expressive, needs to have the same expressivity, at least the same expressivity than the extended language. So we cannot change the base language. If the base language doesn't support concurrency, we are not going to be able to retrofit this uh, into the base language using extension. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, Ruben Rowe, UCL in London. Um, that was a very nice talk, thanks. Um, you motivated that by uh, giving, um, an, or by describing existing de-sugaring approaches, and you gave this example, uh, essentially it was in Java. And I was wondering, so Java is a type language, um, and I was wondering, do these existing approaches, if, if they have type information in the beginning, um, are they just throwing that type information away when they do this desugaring and then the type checking? And, and if so, I mean, why, why, is, why is that? And, uh, um, so the existing work falls into two categories, or actually three categories. 
So there is work where you don't have context sensitive disagreements. So you cannot do, you cannot inspect the types in order to make decisions about how you disagree. So that's one category. Uh, and the other one is where you do have this information, but you don't get any guarantees about what the result of the disagreement will be. So you don't get these preservation properties. Uh, it's a nice talk. Uh, I'm wondering if the uh, sound act supports uh, a feature like hygiene. For example, you may only capture problems, capture variables in the environment, and if you don't uh, do hygiene in disagreeing, it might be capture wrong variables. That, is that a part of the problem? Um, no, it's not a problem because, so, so first, our type rules, they are explicit about the context, right? So we have to manage our names manually when we write down, when we write these extensions. But then part of the preservation uh, or part of the desugaring is that you need to prove that the desugared code is well typed in the same context as the original code. So it's really the same names being available. And that sometimes means you actually have to, uh, when you generate code, you sometimes have to hide bindings that you generated such that the verification procedure can guarantee any, uh, this composer with any other existing code. That's exactly what the one example was about, where we had to introduce the scope around the iterator. Thank you, Raj. Thank you again. Thank you.